a channel called the Alabama Prisoner Profile. Shout out to Alabama Prisoner Profile. Y'all get a chance, y'all go over there and check that brother out. For a lot of y'all that's really, really looking for the behind the scenes stuff that goes on within the Alabama prison system, y'all go over there to Alabama Prisoner Profile and check him out, man. DC the boys Alabama prisoner profiles what's going on with y'all man make sure y'all like sub share comment on the video cash app paypal super thanks Bama prison files with two s's hit that join button and become a member for two dollars a month man stop playing y'all already know what's going on man so no housekeeping today other than y'all hit me up in all the socials if you're trying to get at me don't just leave comments like I said the socials are in the description in the bio all that type stuff get at me if you're trying to come on show and we'll chop some up i got some stuff going on here coming down the pipe for y'all that i think y'all are shit i know y'all are gonna like it right now today we have a prisoner <clears throat> we have a prisoner who was found unresponsive in donaldson correctional facility under some more wild circumstances let's hop right into that right now a state inmate died sunday at william e donaldson correctional facility in western jefferson county the jefferson county coroner's office identified the inmate monday as john lionel buski he was 63 years old buski was serving a life sentence for the 1993 shooting death of his father state representative John Bilski Sr. The deadly shooting during a domestic dispute happened in Montgomery. Now, who is bro? Who is Mr. Bilski? Who is his father? Right? So, I found a little bit about his appeal in the case on the net, and we're gonna hop right in there and see what happened with this case and see who dude is real quick, right? The appellant, John Lionel Bilski, was indicted on February 5th, 1993 for murder. The indictment alleged the appellant intentionally caused the death of his father, John Lee Buski, by shooting him with a gun. The jury found the appellant guilty as charged in the indictment, and the appellant was sentenced to life in the penitentiary. Approximately two years before the shooting, Cheryl Harding and the appellant had a relationship, and that relationship produced a child named Jermaine. The appellant was unable to support this child financially, so the appellant's parents allowed Ms. Harding Jermaine and Timothy, Mrs. Harding's son by a previous relationship, to live in their house. The appellant also lived with his parents. Mrs. Busky testified that the relationship between the appellant and his father had deteriorated in the years before Mrs. Harding moved in. Confrontations between the appellant and Mr. Busky included verbal and physical exchanges. <clears throat> On December the 3rd, 1992, some hours after the shooting, the appellant God damn this train. The appellant told police that he and his father struggled over the rifle and that it discharged accidentally unaliving Mr. Buski. The appellant said he then panicked, ran, and later decided to turn himself in to police. At trial, two witnesses, Calvin Cochran and Robert Leon Williams, testified on the night of the shooting that they heard a woman scream and that upon arriving at the scene, they saw two men arguing and the woman continued to scream. Mr. Cochran said that he left to call the police. Mr. Williams testified he saw all three individuals go into the Busky residence and he then heard a gunshot from inside the residence. According to Mr. Williams, within seconds after the gunshot, a woman came running out the front door of the house. The appellant then came out the front door holding a rifle and yelling at the woman. You think I'm bluffing? You think I'm bluffing? Shit, clearly you're not playing, bro. Mr. Williams said that the appellant then ran back into the house and she, he did not see him again. 
He said he did see Mrs. Buski arrive alone at the house, enter after the gunshot had been fired, and a short time later leave with two small children. Mr. Williams said that he took the children to a neighbor's house and then returned. By that time, police had arrived and would not let anyone enter the house. Officers Charles Athey and G.P. Shirley were the first police officers to arrive at the scene. Officer Charles Althey testified he saw a black male come out of the front door of the house, then run back in. Officer G.B. Shirley, who was driving the patrol car, testified that he heard what sounded like a fence in the backyard rattling as someone hit it and jumped over it. The officer testified that after Mrs. Buski told them about the shooting, they requested paramedics and entered the residence. They found Mr. Buski in the upstairs hall on the floor, apparently unalived. The officers secured the scene and awaited the paramedics and detectives. Officer H.D. Kenny, an evidence technician with the Montgomery Police Department, testified after arriving at the scene, he began to, quote, process the scene and collect evidence. As part of this procedure, Officer Kenny photographed and videotaped the scene, collected physical evidence, including a spent shell casing and a box of empty shells, a gun case, all of which were in the appellant's bedroom. Officer Kenny later found the shirt the appellant was wearing at the time of the shooting in a duffel bag under a bed at the home of Joan Richardson, the appellant's girlfriend. The appellant's rifle was hidden under a sofa in Miss Richardson's bedroom. Eric Wine, a fire medic sergeant with the Montgomery Fire Department, testified upon arriving at the scene of the shooting, he found Mr. Buski in the hallway lying on his right side with his right arm pinned underneath his body. Mr. Buski was pronounced unalive at the scene. Dr. J.R. Loradison, Loradison, a state medical examiner, offered expert forensic testimony regarding the wounds on Mr. Buski's body and the cause of unaliving. Doctor testified that in his opinion, the abrasions found on Mr. Buski's chest were caused by a blow from the butt of a rifle. Doctor also testified that the bullet had entered Mr. Buski's chest, penetrated his heart, exited the right side of his chest had bruised the inside of his right arm without exiting through his jacket damn indicating that mr buski's right arm was pinned against his body at the time of the shooting the left arm showed no traces of gunpowder residue indicating that at the time of the shooting it was being held out of the way of the body and was out of direct line of fire so they taught they said this struggle is 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 some bullshit Craig Bailey, an expert in trace evidence at the Department of Forensic Services, testified the markings of the butt plate of the appellant's rifle matched the marks found in the abrasions on Mr. Buski's chest. Damn. Joe Salam, a firearms and tool mark examiner with the Department of Forensic Sciences, offered expert testimony concerning the operation of the rifle and the physical evidence that showed how it was used to shoot Mr. Buski. Mr. Salam testified that he had fired the rifle and had matched the rifling marks and durations on the test bullet with the bullet recovered from Mr. Buski and determined that they were fired by the same rifle. He also testified he compared the shell casings from the testing with the actual shell casing taken from the scene and they matched. Mr. Slam further testified the rifle was within a few feet of Mr. Buski's chest when it was fired. Point blank. Appellant testified he and Miss Harding had a serious argument that began in her car on December 3rd and moved into the front yard and then into the house where the father became involved. Pellant testified he went upstairs to get his gun intending to intimidate and to scare Miss Harding and that his father approached him and there was a struggle in the upstairs hallway. Pellant testified during this struggle the rifle discharged and Mr. Buski was fatally shot. The appellant's memory of detailed shooting was unclear. He stated he could not remember several interviews in this time and that things just, quote, happened so fast. He testified after the shooting, he panicked and ran out the front door, then turned around, ran back in the house, ran back out the front door, jumped over the fence in the backyard and ran into Joan Richardson's house. There he said he put the rifle under a sofa in her bedroom, removed his shirt, putting it in a duffel bag, which he put under the bed. Pellet testified... Later that night, he turned himself in and gave a statement. Pellant testified Mr. Buski said to Miss Harding something to the effect of, quote, he's just bluffing. Damn. Pellant also testified he was angry with Miss Harding for not moving out 
and at his father for not making her move out. He did acknowledge the steps that had taken to fire the rifle, loading around in the chamber, cocking the rifle, pulling the trigger safety lever up, then pulling the trigger. Appellant could not explain the absence of any evidence of a struggle at the instant of the shooting. He testified he did not call for medical assistance for his father at the time of the shooting, did not call later to check on his father. Appellant also could not explain the presence of the abrasions caused by the butt of the rifle on his father's chest. Defense then asked to be allowed to put Miss Harding's six-year-old son, Timothy, on the stand. He apparently was an eyewitness to the shooting. After defense asked Timothy a few questions, trial court determined the child was not competent to testify. Defense objected and trial court overruled. Joan Richardson, the appellant's girlfriend, testified next. Testified on several occasions over a period of a couple years, the appellant had brought his gun to her house and that when he did, she made him put it under the sofa in her bedroom. She also testified he had bought the gun for hunting and that he had mentioned that he also kept it for protection because he had recently been robbed. Trial court was affirmed by the appeal court and his appeal was denied. Right back up to the present day. Authorities said Buski was found unresponsive at 4.39 a.m. Sunday on the floor of a prison dorm. He was pronounced unalived at 5.05 a.m. Chief Deputy Coroner Bill Gates said there was no sign of foul play or trauma. The cause of death is pending additional lab studies. Alabama Department of Corrections Law Enforcement Services Division is investigating the circumstances surrounding the death. Representative Buski, his father, was 54 at the time of his unaliving. According to Wire reports at the time, his brother was State Representative James Buski of Mobile. John Buski Sr., a Democrat and educator, was elected to the legislature in 1986 to the West Montgomery District 77 seat. He was among 13 other black lawmakers arrested when they attempted to remove the confederate flag from atop the state capitol in february 1988 damn people been on that i ain't realize he won a second term in 1990 shortly after his death shocked some of the alabama's best known political figures quote i enjoyed working with him we ask all alabamians to play for pray for representative buski's loved ones at this time quote then govern governor guy hunt said now tapped in you know what i'm saying with my little folks at now i'm saying you know we got another dorm and another block scoop right and i'm only really bringing y'all these up there you know sir for the most part actually there's a backstory behind you know there's been 20 overdoses you know what i'm saying they're just typical that have happened you know since the beginning of the year right quote there is no police in the dorm as usual Mr. John Buski was found this morning at breakfast on his knees, gasping for air. Mr. Buski has passed away from choking. When the COs arrived in the dorm, it was too late. He was already gone. The appellant told police that he and his father struggled over the rifle and that it discharged accidentally unaliving Mr. Buski. The appellant said he then panicked, ran, and later decided to turn himself in to police. At trial, two witnesses... Calvin Cochran and Robert Leon Williams testified on the night of the shooting that they heard a woman scream and that upon arriving at the scene, they saw two men arguing and the woman continued to scream. Mr. Cochran said that he left to call the police. Mr. Williams testified he saw all three individuals go into the Buski residence and he then heard a gunshot from inside the residence. According to Mr. Williams, within seconds after the gunshot, a woman came running out the front door of the house. The appellant then came out the front door holding a rifle and yelling at the woman. You think I'm bluffing? You think I'm bluffing? Shit, clearly you're not playing, bro. Mr. Williams said that the appellant then ran back into the house and she, he did not see him again. He said he did see Mrs. Buski arrive alone at the house, enter after the gunshot had been fired, and a short time later leave with two small children. Mr. Williams said that she took the children to a neighbor's house and then returned. By that time, police had arrived and would not let anyone enter the house. Officers Charles Athney and G.P. Shirley were the first police officers to arrive at the scene. Officer Charles Athney testified he saw a black male come out the front door of the house, then run back in. 
Officer G.P. Shirley, who was driving the patrol car, testified he heard what sounded like a fence in the backyard rattling as someone jumped over it. Officers testified that after Mrs. Buski told them about the shooting, they requested paramedics and entered the residence. They found Mr. Buski in the upstairs hall on the floor, apparently unalive. Officers secured the scene and awaited the paramedics and detectives. Officer H.D. Kinney, an evidence technician with the Montgomery Police Department, testified after arriving at the scene, he began to process the scene and collect evidence. As part of this procedure, Officer Kinney photographed and videotaped the scene, collected physical evidence, including a spent shell casing, an empty box of shells, and a gun case, all of which were in the appellant's bedroom. Officer Kenny later found the shirt that the appellant was wearing at the time of the shooting in a duffel bag under a bed at the home of Joan Richardson, the appellant's girlfriend. Appellant's rifle was hidden under a sofa in Miss Richardson's bedroom. Eric Wine, a fire medic sergeant with the Montgomery Fire Department, testified upon arriving at the scene of the shooting, he found Mr. Buski in the hallway lying on his right side with his right arm pinned beneath his body. Mr. Buski was pronounced unalived at the scene. Dr. J.R. Lauradison, a state medical examiner, offered expert forensic testimony regarding the wounds on Mr. Buski's body and the cause of death. Doctor testified in his opinion abrasions on Mr. Buski's chest were caused by a blow from the butt of the rifle. Doctor also testified a bullet entered Mr. Buski's chest penetrated his heart, exited the right side of his chest, and had bruised the inside of his right arm without exiting through his jacket, indicating Mr. Buski's right arm was pinned against his body at the time of the shooting. The left arm showed no traces of gunpowder residue, indicating at the time of the shooting it was being held out away from the body and was out of the direct line of fire. Craig Bailey, an expert in trace evidence at the Department of Forensic Sciences, testified the markings on the butt plate of the appellant's rifle matched the marks found in the abrasions on Buski's chest. Joe Salome, a fire alarm, firearms and tool mark examiner with the Department of Forensic Sciences, offered expert testimony concerning the operation of the rifle and the physical evidence that showed how it was used to shoot Mr. Buski. Mr. Salome testified... He had fired the rifle and had matched the rifling marks and striations on the test bullet with the bullet recovered from Buski and determined they were fired by the same rifle. He also testified he compared the shell casings with actual shell casings taken from the scene. They matched. Sloan further testified the rifle was within a few feet of Mr. Buski's chest when it was fired. Point blank some. The appellant testified... He and Miss Harding had a serious argument that began in her car on December 3rd and that moved to the Buski's front yard and into the house where the appellant's father, Mr. Buski, became involved. The appellant testified he went upstairs to get his gun intending to intimidate and to scare Miss Harding and that his father approached him and there was a struggle in the upstairs hallway. As he should, bro. You need a rifle to scare a female? The appellant testified during his struggle, the rifle discharged and Buski was fatally shot. Mr. Buski, that is. The appellant's memory of the details of the shooting was unclear, of course. He stated he could not remember several intervals in this time period. Quote, things just happened so fast. He testified after the shooting, he panicked, ran out the door, turned around, ran back in the house, ran out the back door, jumped over the fence in the backyard, and ran to Joan Richardson's house. There he said... But the rifle under a sofa in her bedroom moved his shirt, putting it in a duffel bag, which he put under the bed. Pellant testified later that night, turned himself in to police and gave a statement. Pellant testified, Mr. Buski said to Miss Harding something to the effect of, quote, he's just bluffing. Pellant also testified he was angry with Miss Harding for not moving out and at his father for not making her leave. He then acknowledged the steps that had taken to be taken to fire the rifle, loading around, cocking the rifle, pulling the trigger safety lever up, then pulling the trigger. Appellant could not explain the absence of any evidence of a struggle at the instant of the shooting. He testified he did not call for medical assistance for his father after the shooting, did not call later to check on his father. Appellant also could not explain the presence of the abrasions caused by the butt of the rifle on his father's chest. 
The defense then asked to be allowed to put Miss Harding's six-year-old son, Timothy, on the stand. He apparently was an eyewitness to the shooting. After defense asked Timothy a few questions, trial court determined the child was not competent to testify. Defense objected and the trial court overruled the objection. Joan Richardson, the appellant's girlfriend, testified next. She testified on several occasions over a period of a couple years. The appellant brought his gun to her house and she made him put it under the sofa in her bedroom. She also testified he had bought the gun for hunting. He had mentioned that he also kept it for protection because he had recently been robbed. So, trial court, boom, bam, wham, affirmed, you know what I'm saying, by the court of appeals, and his appeal was denied, basically, you know. Back to present day, right? Authorities said Buski was found unresponsive at 4.39 a.m., Sunday on the floor of a prison dorm. He was pronounced unalived at 5.05 a.m. Chief Deputy Coroner Bill Yates said there was no sign of foul play or trauma. The cause of death is pending autopsy. Right. The Alabama Department of Corrections Law Enforcement Services Division is investigating the circumstances surrounding the unalive or death. I guess it's not an unaliving because nobody unalived him. Representative Buski, his father, the victim, was 54 at the time of his unaliving, according to wire reports at the time. His brother was a state representative, James Buski. John Buski Sr., a Democrat and educator, was elected to the legislature in 1986 to the West Montgomery District 77 seat. He was among 13 other black lawmakers arrested when they attempted to remove the Confederate flag from atop the state capitol in February 1988. Oh, they've been on that. <laughs> He's, he won a second term shortly after that in 1990. His unaliving shocked some of Alabama's best known political figures. Quote, I enjoyed working with him. We ask all Alabamians to pray for Representative Buski's loved ones at this time, unquote. Then Governor Guy Hunt said. Now, boom, bam, we got the dorm scoop, which I saw that was shared by, you know, prominent advocate with the source in the dorm at this time, right? And this is what the dorm scoop is, or the block scoop, rather, since this was the Donald's or dorm, fuck it. There was no police in the dorm, as usual. Mr. John Buski was found this morning during breakfast on his knees gasping for air. Mr. Buski has passed away from choking to death. When the CO has arrived in the dorm, it was too late. He was already gone. Claude, have mercy, man. That's well, man. Let me know what y'all think about this in the comment section. I'm going to tell you right now, this wild, bro. Aside from bro's case, that's wild. You you did that, you know what I'm saying? You crashed out and unalived your dad, you know what I'm saying? Got to pay for that. But, you know, Donaldson ain't no, you know, ain't no, well, they're at, this is that chow, right? Cartoon was saying most prisoners go to breakfast because it's like the best meal Alabama's got to serve of the day usually, right? So it's, it, this happened during breakfast while most people were outside the dorm and whoever did find him, I guess, gasping for air does not or did not know the Heimlich maneuver. And when they went to get police, they weren't there. I guess there's nobody nearby that knew the Heimlich maneuver. Because they don't take that long to choke to death when your airway is obstructed like that. Let me know what y'all think about this in the comment section, man. Like, share, subscribe. Cash out PayPal. Bama Prison Files. Two S's. Super thanks. Cop the membership. Two dollars. Become a member. DC The Voice, Alabama Prisoner Profiles,